Welcome to Texans Unfiltered. And here we go, here we go! A Houston football podcast for your Houston Texans. Hot, hot! All right, guys, welcome back to another edition of Texans Unfiltered. A Houston football podcast for your Houston Texans. I am young Ari Gold, and I am joined by my friend and co-host, John Wade, the Garnet Texan. And don't forget, Texans Unfiltered is brought to you by Run Game Clothing. Go to rungameclothing.com. Use promo code UNFILTERED for 15% off your order. Make sure you go get the Houston Savages shirt that they released. Lots uh, of First luck. release was today. <laughs> first release was today, and you'd have to pick it up in, in, uh, in person. I think then they're releasing them online, so they're pretty sick shirts. Um, yeah, all right. A couple house cleaning things before we get to the stuff that you guys are here for. If anybody wants to run the uh, our, our Instagram, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. I, I just I hate it. I don't like Instagram. Um, and John's turned me into a Twitter fiend, so now all I use is Twitter. Wait, why is this my uh, fault? So if anybody wants to run the Instagram, because I was never into Twitter until I met you, so it's your fault. Um, Maybe it has like to do with the podcast. Oh, I, I honestly, know. you know what? I'll, I'll be honest. I'll be honest. I'll be honest. It's actually Bill O'Brien's fault. Oh, okay. So, I was about um, to say, am I the Bill yeah, O'Brien got, of the uh, podcast? Everything's my fault. Yep. Yep. Yeah, he got me into Twitter. It's Bill's fault. Um, <laughs> so yeah, anybody wants to run Instagram, uh, feel free to hit me up. I, I don't. We don't need a lot. Just a couple posts a week. Something about the podcast. Like, you know, if you guys have done it, want to do it. I know we have a lot of you guys that have pretty successful Instagram pages. So um, if one of you guys wants to run it, hit me up. Uh, and then that's it. Let's get straight into the shits. Um, so let's get into. I, I guess recap and reactions, John. Are we sure we don't want to start um, with? Uh- with the GM Bill O'Brien stuff, seeing as that's well, here's why I don't want to because it didn't play a part in this game. Yeah, but we're a weekly podcast, so we are, and we'll get to it at the end. Okay, fair enough. Let's get into let's the, recap game. the game, and so, then we'll we'll get into that. Well, before um, we tear the game apart, so, okay, gonna, let's not look at notes. I'm gonna before we tear the game apart, I'm just gonna start with my instant reaction of it. The Colts had to play Mm -hmm. one of the John says he has a lot to say, by the way, the Colts played one of their better games of the year to barely beat us. And we are we cussing? Can we cuss again? Yeah, yeah, it's all it's all fair game now. We're back to normal and filter. Okay, so we had to shit. We played like shit. I mean, there's Mm -hmm. we played like shit. They played one of their best games. Yep. They still barely beat us. Yep. If we go out there, we play with a little bit more discipline. If we, you know, regress back up to the mean in red zone efficiency, if we, you know, have refs that I don't even want to get started mm-hmm. on the refs, but let's just say that the game was called just a little bit more even and we win the game. Like it's a completely different, a completely different score. The Colts had to have all those factors. Our, I mean, our defense right now, our secondary has been absolutely shredded. So that's part of the reason why Brissett had the game of his life, but he had it, the game of his life to win by seven. Is that it? That's my intro. We got a lot to talk about. Okay. Um, no, I agree. I think um, okay, let's just address the ref now. Look, the entire league is dealing with this. Um, this isn't just a Colts Texans game. Um, you know, the chief, if you ask chiefs fans, they got the bad call of it last week against us. Um, if you watch the lions game, they literally lost a game because of two bad calls. Um, I rewatched the game today, you know, whatever, like you're going to have to overcome bad officiating moving forward. Like this league is not there. The officiating has just taken a complete step backwards. So either adjust and find a way to, to overcome it or just get all your drafts ready in in Twitter to send out all the ref officiating tweets because uh, you're going to be sending them out almost every week. It's just the way it works. They're, they're not good this year. It's inconsistent as can be. It's an absolute, like nobody really understands the rules. It is, it is. And it's, you know, a full season of this, which is what we've already gotten through seven weeks. um, As this has been a hot topic for a lot of fan bases and a lot of teams. Um, if we get a full season of this, there's there's going to be some things at the end of the season that aren't going to be good. Um, the games aren't necessarily unwatchable, but they're getting there. 
and when outcomes are being are become are becoming because of flags being called and thrown and their ghosts um it, it's just going to hurt the game so but with that said well, best, we did not lose the game because of the, the flag. best twitter comment okay? i saw and on I'll, it though I'll, I'll, is what's going to this is gonna, what's going to ruin football because you're going to sit there and you can't even celebrate a good play until you make sure that there's no flag or if a good play happens it's like you're always constantly waiting for the flag and it shouldn't be like this uh i agree no i agree and um when i when i first watched all 22 today the the first thing that popped out to me was there was a flag on philip Gaines um on ty hilton in the first quarter it was pass interference call it was third down uh literally ty hilton just got a bump from philip Gaines on his shoulder and they called the flag and i mean seriously just go back and watch it there was n- there was no other contact outside of it was just that called the flag um there were a couple other ones that were just awful calls but then there were ones that we did that were on us uh, you know Laramie Tunsil needs to get the false starts under control it, it's com- it's getting completely out right of i mean we had our fair share of penalties but there's three yes, in particular the there's, receiver there's twice. three particular ones that were essentially phantom calls or you know the Deshaun one, I'm counting that as part of the three that turned the game. Mm. Two of the uh, ones on defense, if they don't happen, the Colts don't convert long third downs and they have to punt. And those end up canceling out scoring drives. And then Deshaun gets his touchdown. That is anywhere from a seven or four, seven to 14 point swing, all based on three penalties. And yes, that Correct. absolutely played a huge, they weren't something that shouldn't have been able to not be overcome, but to say that it's not the reason we lost is also not entirely true. And it's not an attitude that you can really take. That's what the NFL wants you to take. They don't want you to come in thinking that the refs screwed you because once you embrace, it's like, Oh, well, everybody has bad penalties. It's like, no, they are throwing games. And it's one of those things that it's almost way it either. It's so obvious that these guys are just incompetent because and it's not the re- entirely the rest's fault. They're part-time employees. They're in the mo- one of the most highly pressurized situations in the, in the world, and definitely in the entertainment industry. You have, I don't know, 80,000 fans at some of these stadiums breathing down your neck. If you get it wrong, there's a lot of pressure there. And some of them may be on the take. Like I don't, I don't really think that's true, but you see it all over Twitter because some of these calls are so bad. And the thing that's most frustrating about it is we do have the technology. We do have the ability now to get the calls correct and they still don't. Okay. Um, I, w- I would agree. Um, one, I'll, I'll never blame refs for a loss. Um, I will. I definitely will. I, I won't, especially when you watch the tape and you see the things that should have happened on the field that didn't happen. When you see Jordan Aikens on a crossing route wide open with the cornerback on the outside of him, uh, in the end zone for a touchdown and you settle for a field goal. Um, and then when you see the same thing with an out route to Darren Fells, who's wide open and instead he forces a throw to Kiki, uh, basically on an out route fully covered by Pierre Desir. Um, when you look at B max unnecessary roughness that basically put them on first and goal. Um, and that was on B Mac. That was not, no, a that one was call. legit. That was yeah. a terrible play by me Mac. And you could see it when he, when he did it, you could see it was intentional. Um, you know, ineligible receivers twice. That's on us. False starts. That's on us. So when you're digging yourself in a hole of one, first and 15, first and 20, and, and those are continuously happening, it's hard for you to dig yourself out of that. Now, does it help that bad calls were, were called? No, it doesn't. But at the same time, when you left 14 points on, or I guess technically that we got two field goals out of them. So when you left eight points on the board and you lost by seven, it, it just tells me a little bit of a different story. And then when you think about that play with BMAC, that if BMAC wouldn't have made that, that, that unnecessary roughness or yeah, roughness, he would have, um, they would have been a field goal. It wouldn't have been a touchdown. And then they would have only been up three at the time. So there's just so many moving pieces right. to it. I just, I'm one that I will never blame. And I refs. say that, I say that both, I say that both ways because I agree with you. Um, and this should be your philosophy in most people's lives. Control what you can control. You cannot control the refs. 
you have to go out there and you have to execute. You have to play within yourself. All that stuff that every coach tells every player, because it is absolutely true. However, us as fans, you can definitely take a step back and say that, yes, the refs absolutely do cost teams games. And no, every team can sit there at the end of the game and point, if we did this or if we did this, if we didn't miss this open throw, that whole list that you went down, every team out there can do it, can do that. Every winning team can go out there and do that and say, if all these things happened right, we would have blown the team out. And these can, things can all be true. It can be true that if they had executed on every play, they could have won. It could be true that if the refs got the calls right, they could have won. It could be true on the other end. If the Colts did the exact same thing on the plays that they missed, they could have blown us up. Like these things can all be true. It's just incredibly frustrating that there is the capability for the referees to get it right. And they don't. And I'm talking about things like technology, um, not necessarily more instant replay, but maybe some uh, essentially a ref that's up in the, in the booth that they don't have to go to replay. They just call it down. They have radios and better camera angles. Now you can put chips in the ball to make sure that it goes, it crosses the plane. Like there's unbelievable amount of stuff that they can do to fix these things. And part of it though, is just starting with make the refs full time, like let them dedicate themselves to actually getting better at being refs, not paying them as part-time employees and they have second jobs. And, you know, it's just, it's just ridiculous because it's not just us. Every single team out there can point to a game that has been screwed over by the refs. Uh, I agree. I agree. I just, uh, you know, I look at like we were still, even with all of that still in the game and had Deshaun planted his front foot on that throw to Kiki and didn't throw it above his head and make him have to jump for it and hit him in his chest. You know, we, we could be having a completely different conversation and nobody would be talking about the refs. It wouldn't even be brought up. I would say we would, I, and we that's would so my biggest, about them. It would just be a lot quick. It would have been just a quicker segment that look at what we overcame. But I, I see. I don't. I don't think so because people. You just forget. You forget those things. You don't think about those things. You're, you're all you play for is to win. So when you do win, you no, don't. No, we would back. still. We would still be talking about that Deshaun touchdown because that that was the biggest horseshit call I've seen all year. Yeah. Well, that call. That call alone. But that's the second one that's happened to him. The other one wasn't a touchdown, but. This one was a touchdown, but yes, agreed. Considering that the explanation was that it was to protect him, and I tweeted this out, and, and then I followed it up with a video of it as well. If it was to protect and where's him, where's the roughing the passer? It was either roughing the passer or it's a touchdown. There can be no other option. It's one or the other. So one, you give them seven, or two, you give them first and goal. Either way, Either one would have been the right call because he took a massive hit after that, after the throw. So um, that's the one I have a big issue with. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that the refs have to adapt to the playing style of each individual player. And we've seen it time and time again that Deshaun is capable of making things happen, whether it's, you know, and, and here's the thing. That guy only had one arm around him. He didn't have two. So he wasn't like that's when from what I read today, that's when he's supposed to be called down. Um, so I don't know. I That's the problem I had. That's the one call that stuck out that I was like, OK, that's that's horseshit. Um, and that would have swung the game. We would have been up three at that point. Uh, you know, if Fairbairn would have made his kick and he made all his kicks yesterday. So I think that hopefully that's corrected. But um, that's so, yeah, that's the one. But outside of that, like. Also on defense, we were freaking awful. So our, I guess let's just get into like our full actual recap. Um, the offense again, John, just continues to start slow. Every single week, first quarter, slow start. Doesn't matter. And it, it makes me wonder, are we ever going to see a full four quarters of offense from this team? I have no idea. I honestly don't. When... um when Deshaun first busted into the league as, as a rookie and he went on that stretch, we started games hot. Other than that, we really haven't. Right. I mean, there's been several games where we've overcome it, but we just don't. It takes them a little bit to get into the rhythm. And 
with the offense that they have constructed, it shouldn't. They should go out there and get some easy plays going. But even when they try to get easy plays going, it's almost like they have to shoot themselves in the foot instead. I think – I don't know. I Honestly, I don't know what the issue is. Um, I do. I will say this. The Colts – the Colts might have been, I'd say that they're the second best defense we've played, but they're probably the best pass defense that we've played. Their young corners are playing extremely well. Carolina yeah. was probably overall the best defense that we played because I of their. I throw it out that Carolina has the most talent, Indianapolis is the most disciplined. Yeah, well, and yeah, okay, so that's fair. Um, and when it comes to execution, the most disciplined tend to outperform the most talented teams. And um, what you saw on Sunday was just really good corners, like really good corners. Um, they are going to be a problem moving forward. Rock Janssen is a very good player. Pierre Desir might be a top 10 cornerback in this league. Um. Darius Leonard is a freaking, you know what I, what I realized and this is going to piss you off, but you know what I realized today when I watched the all 22, man, the way they use Darius Leonard, you know who it reminds me of? No. Who's that? Jadavian Clowney outside of the coverage aspect, the way they move him around on the D line, he'll rush from the outside. He'll rush in the middle. They'll send him on just a middle linebacker blitz they'll he'll rush with his hands in the dirt which was strange um it's it's very it's very reminiscent of what we saw done here with Clowney. yeah that is interesting because usually um i need to rewatch the tape because usually darius leonard is an off the ball linebacker like he's um he's closer to like a keekly right like a middle linebacker that's just i mean he's supposed to play coverage he's the guy that goes out there and just cleans everything up so wow i didn't notice that yeah like, Um, that, that actually probably explains a lot because you're sitting there expecting him to be off the ball and he's sitting there acting as a rusher. Well, yeah. And he hit, he hit Deshaun like two or three times. Yeah. Uh, There was one play where he was uh, the middle linebacker and he went in for, for a a blitz and the, um, right on Nick Martin and then noticed that Deshaun moved out of the pocket. He spun back, went to the outside and that's when Deshaun made that throw to Deandre for, a first down that he probably should not have been able to get off. It was like a seven yard pass, but I mean, Darius Sunder is a freak. I mean, he's a, he's an, yeah, he really he's is. A, he's a freak. He's, freak of nature. dude. He, I said it after that draft. He was one of my favorite players in that draft. And I had hoped that he had a drop to us and got to give the Colts credit for going up and getting him. And they even got accused of reaching for him. Yeah. So they took him in the second and he had like a third or a fourth round grade. So, We'll talk about it a little bit later about when we kind of talk about draft picks and, you know, the Texans supposedly not having any. Right. But Darius Leonard, I mean, he's an absolute player and it sucks that he's on the Colts. It really does. I mean, I wish we had gone after Desir um, in free agency. Um, I think that we should have made an effort to pry him away from the Colts because I think he is a fantastic corner. But yeah, it's kind of they've put together a very good defense and they're very well coached. And it's going to be frustrating and you can't go out there and make a whole bunch of mistakes against them. But again, we did and we still should have won it. Like Deshaun wasn't great. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't awful. He wasn't Carolina. He wasn't great. No, he wasn't Carolina Deshaun, but he wasn't Kansas city, Atlanta Deshaun either. No, which was kind of to be expected. Much better. I mean, the more, right. And the thing that was more disappointing was Carlos Hyde getting absolutely nothing. Yeah. And even frustration with the play calling, because you could see that when we switched to running more zone, the Duke Johnson was just eating. Yep. And then we all of a sudden would just get away from that. Yep. And I, that's one of the valid criticisms about this coaching staff is sometimes they get too cute. They'll have something that's working and then they'll try and outsmart the other team and just grind themselves to a halt. Yeah. This is what I pulled away from, from the game. Um, and it, it's common sense, but just to put it into perspective, a very good Colts team with a very, very good coach, potentially coach of the year candidate type coach, considering what he dealt with with Andrew Luck leaving and what they're putting on the field. Um, 
coming off of a bye and getting an extra week of tape on the Texans offense. And they played at home and they played a team that was beaten up. Secondary is bad. He knew exactly where to attack. And what happened was we lost by seven. I really think that's all there is to it. I don't think the Colts are a better team. I don't think the Colts have more talent. I think that one, they do have a better coach. I'll be the first to say it. Like I, I know that we're, I'm considered a Bill O'Brien apologist, but um, and I do think Bill O'Brien's a good coach. Frank Reich is a better coach. Yeah, I love Frank Reich. It, it's just hard not to. <laughs> Again, there's when we talked about whether or not Bill O'Brien should go two off seasons ago. I was the first person, and I that was just absolutely saying that Frank Wright, even though I didn't think he would be welcome in Houston, considering what he's done right. to us, but that he I actually, my, that was my comment. He owes us. And of course he goes to Indianapolis and that's bullshit because he is an absolute, he's a great coach and he's a great staff. The Colts do not. Yeah. The Colts do not have the talent we have. I would say that. I would even say that when our offense is firing on all cylinders, our offense is better than theirs. It's a better offense put together. However, Frank Reich has done a great job of playing with it or coaching within his players and putting together a staff that is very, very smart. Yep. I mean, the the defense, the Colts defense is what makes these some of these players great players. Like Darius Leonard is an absolute beast. You can put him on any team out there. But their corners and I like to see her, but he, part of the reason that he's so good is the way that he is used there. And he would still be a fine corner, but I don't think he would be as good as he is on another team. Um, yeah, I would agree. I mean, well, and isn't this like Pierre to see like second or third team? Um, I believe. I thought he was just undrafted. No, yeah, I mean, he, he was undrafted, sure. but I thought he spent some time on another and on another team in camp. Um, Anyways, look, you're right. Like the team, they're, they're just a really good coach staff or a uh, coach team, and they have a really good staff. Uh, they have very good players. Um, Jacoby Brissett, we made him look like Joe Montana yesterday, like literally. The, I mean, he was just he was really good. He had his best game as a NFL quarterback, of course, against us, and he's four zero against us. Um, no, I, I'm mistaken. He was actually drafted by the Browns. Okay, that's what I thought. Makes sense that he wasn't. So on he the was a, after that. a fourth round pick by the Browns. He's also been on the Chargers and the Seahawks. So there you go. Dang. You were right. Yeah. Um, so enough, though. Enough. Enough talking up the Colts. They are a good team. We're a better team. I truly believe that. Um, they just got us on yeah. a bad week. And uh, I, I expect the next time we play on Thursday Night Football, we'll beat them. Or Sunday Night Football. I think it's Sunday Night. Thursday Night? Thursday Night. I don't know. Whatever. Um, all right. Either way, the point still stands. We should beat them. Yes. This is this is one of those games that was entirely I, I'm not kidding. I was throwing stuff. Like that tweet was me being serious because again, the refs it's a game that we legitimately felt like we should have won. Uh and yeah. And I'll give Bill O'Brien this. There's only been a handful of games where you know we didn't would go out there and would lose, but we always felt like we should lose. Like you felt like we were out coached. We felt like we were outplayed. This game really didn't feel like that. They were just played more disciplined and just some, we just didn't catch any breaks whatsoever. Yeah, no, I, I, I literally, my daughter actually wanted to spend time with me and watch the game with me, which was a shock. So we went to Chili's. And I will, I usually won't go to a Chili's, but it just happened to be right by the house. So we just went to Chili's and I watched the first five minutes there and, uh, she could see that I was pissed off and she was like, what's wrong? I was like, can we, let's just go home. I don't want to be out in public while this is happening right now. I, I mean, it's just so disappointing. And I mean, that's truly how I felt. I mean, it was one of those games where you could just tell from the beginning this wasn't going to be our game. Um, even when Deshaun got the ball back, I just did. I wasn't confident that we were going to pull this off. It just wasn't going our way. And um, yeah, so whatever. Um, let's see any other recaps. 
I don't know. I guess that's really about it. I mean, that's the game recap. I guess let's get into the offense. So Deshaun was 23 of 34, 308 yards, one TD, and two interceptions. Um, that last interception, I don't really – I mean, I put on him because it was a bad place ball. But that's not like one of those interceptions where you're like, God, that was an awful like awful read. Yeah. You shouldn't have thrown that ball. It was more you should have thrown the ball where it should have been. Um, it was a it was a bad throw, but it was still something Kiki, I bet you, feels as though he normally catches. I, it, the only problem was when I were I were so me and Preston got into this this argument on Sunday and I went back and rewatched it and sent him a clip like Kiki was fully extended and jumping and it hit the fingertips of his hand like the ball was just too high. I don't think it was a catchable ball for Kiki. I think if that was DeAndre Kenny will, yes. But K- Kiki's so small. I thought it was a bad throw. That No, I, I, just I, I agree think, it was a bad I don't throw. Think he, I think that I don't think Kiki oh man. Um Yeah. Yeah. Recording this while watching the uh World Series game one. You all can probably tell what part of the game we're at based on things so we'll just keep going um anyway so i just thought it was a bad throw and i i I think that if he would have put it in the right spot it would have been great catch and then things would have you know potentially worked out but um it it was just an overthrow uh he was decisive this game though he picked up the blitzes a lot better than he has in in the past at least specifically against the colts in the wildcard game last year Uh, so he's definitely getting better in that area so it's what you want to see uh, we've seen it the last two weeks, so I'm glad that it translated into this game as well. He took some hits, but um, you know, for anybody that thought that he was going to go through the rest of the season not getting sacked because he went two games without it, like I don't know what world you're living in. That's just not the way the NFL works. Um, it's just, oh, thank God. Um, oh, um, this is going to be really hard. Um, <laughs> uh, I should turn the TV off. Uh, the picking up the blitz. Yes. So he's getting better at that. It's great. Um, I hope that's something he continues to build on. Like I said, he was very decisive. Uh, there were times where he wasn't going through his reads. He locked on, uh, to his first read instead of going through the progressions. Um, but they, I mean, he, he wasn't awful. No, he wasn't, he wasn't Carolina to show. Yeah. He, he wasn't great, but he wasn't awful. This loss isn't on him. I would agree. I would agree. But he also wasn't helped out with a run game. Um, he missed some open receivers. But, I mean, I we've seen that when the run game's clicking and uh, it just gives Deshaun everything he needs. Um, and they did a good job of shutting down the run this week. I would say that the best thing that the uh, Colts did on defense was they just they kept Deshaun from getting hot. They kept him just frustrated enough. And you, you could kind of tell. He was frustrated and mad the entire game. And it wasn't so much where it's shown maturity because in the past where when he'd get like that, he would make just dumb, dumb decisions. And he didn't really make dumb decisions. It was just one of those where just one of those games for him. Like it wasn't horrible. Like if you look at his stats, 300 yards passing. I mean, remember there was a time when we would get super excited when we had 300 yards passing and one TD yeah. and two interceptions that entire stat line when we had a better defense that would have won that would have won us games easily so it just is what it is yeah um i think it's really about it on Deshaun. uh the run game carlos hyde uh 12 carries 35 yards duke johnson seven carries 34 yards two receptions for 22 yards um i've been calling for duke to get a little bit more carries uh i think after this week maybe we'll see it uh, there's one play in particular that I remember it was a third down run. He almost turned it into something. I mean, he had, he was dancing all over the field. I think he only ended up gaining like six yards, but he should have been tackled for loss. Um, th- that like that, when I see those moments from Duke, I'm like, God, I just, I wish we would get the ball in his hands more. Like he's, he's so slippery and he's so good. Yeah, I agree. I mean, Carlos Hyde is definitely the better power back, but you don't always need a power back. And there's times where right. having, especially this day and age in the NFL, we're just having somebody that is slippery and that has always positive yards and can turn nothing into something pretty consistently. You know, 
that's all those things Duke can do. And we actually had our best success against the Colts on offense is when they were running a lot of zone with Duke. Duke can make things happen. And I agree. I think that they should give him some more touches and kind of get my ideal usage for them would be kind of the split that LeGarrette Blount and Jan Lewis had a couple of years back where Lewis was the worker workhorse. He was the primary running back and Blount would come in, you know, to grind the clock, score some runs or not score some runs, uh, score touchdowns, things like that. And you just use, but Lewis was primarily used from 20 to 20. And I think that that'd be probably the best bet for, um, for Johnson. Yeah, I think, I think we'll start to see him a little bit more. I, I think I've said from week two that the, the, the issue I have is just the fact that they're running, they're running uh, Carlos outside and they're not letting Duke be the outside runner. Um, you know, that's just, that's Duke's specialty. Get him in space and just see what happens. Duke's really just that up and down runner. Um, so maybe we'll see more of that uh, this week. Uh, also, guys, with us recording during the, the World Series, this will probably be a shorter podcast. But don't worry. Don't get your panties in a bunch. Um, I am doing a recap uh, podcast tomorrow with Zach Hicks from Stampede Blue um, on the Colts. Yeah. So you guys will luckily get two this week. And shorter so, just by uh, our past us. couple of week standards because we're already at 30 minutes. So, you know. Yeah. And yeah. And it's really uh, it's really hard for me to focus. Um all right. Um, the wide receivers looked really good, though. I, I, like, that's like DeAndre looked really good uh, for every, like all the Colts fans that were saying that Pierre Desir can just shut down DeAndre. That's not the case. Uh, 108 yards, one TD. Uh, Kenny looked good, 105 yards. Uh, Kiki looked good. Um, the issue that I had with the offense this week wasn't the fact that we were able to get the ball to the wide receivers. It was more or less the fact that we couldn't get the ball to the tight ends. Yeah. No, the middle of the field was still there. Um, we were able to move again. It was one of those games where 20 to 20, we could move the ball. Um, once we got in the red zone, we, we knew we wouldn't be able to continue at a 70% touchdown rate. That just wasn't going to happen, but you know, to drop that hard, that far, that quickly, that's a lot on the Colts. I mean, when the field's compressed, it does take a lot more discipline. And they and they showed it. They they did it, and we weren't able to score touchdowns. And we could have. I mean, I don't know if they just the way that they did their coverages just kind of got into Deshaun's head. But he actually did have receivers there in the middle of the field. If he had looked for Aikens, he'd looked for Fells. Heck, if he even looked at for Duke Johnson when they were in the red zone, those plays were there, and he just kept missing them. Yeah, I agree. Um, all right. Uh, other parts of the offense. Uh, technically, it's not offense, it's special teams, but uh, that was a great play by Korea. Um, the uh, no miss kicks. Maybe they fixed the holding issue. Maybe. Maybe it, it's easier to hold indoors, too. So maybe that helped. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a, it's a small sample size. But um, it's a it's a positive to take away from the game. Uh, let's get to the defense. There's really not a lot of good here. The good is the typical good uh, every week, except for one that I need to start off with before I get destroyed. Uh, JJ had a great game. JJ had a very, very good game. Uh, and I thought that watching the game, and then today when I rewatched the game, uh, he really... He, he really had an a outstanding game. Um, when I say outstanding, I mean, I know he doesn't have the sacks, but it looked like 2012 J.J. Watt. Yeah, J.J. I know it's like J.J. was, uh, he, was def- he was just yeah. murdering anybody in front of him. J.J. was an absolute player. Um, D.J. Reader was a player. Destroyed yeah, Quentin I Nelson mean, multiple times. Reader on Nelson. Reader doesn't have a lot of stats, but that's because he, you know, he was going toe to toe with Nelson and 
Well, yeah. and it's the position he plays too. They didn't and, run the ball. A lot. I mean, Marlon Mack looked like one of the best running backs in the league, according to several analysts before the game, and he didn't do anything against this defense. And I and I would actually agree. I thought he was a top five back coming into this week. I still do. I think that we were just prepared to shut him down. I think we thought that we can make Brissett beat us, and unfortunately, yeah. he did. We just ran out of depth at at corner. We were already we were already short. Yeah, and then. Actually, when Jonathan Joseph went back out, the corners got better. Um, Gain played T.Y. Hilton as well as any slot corner we've had in the past couple of years has. And then he got hurt. And I mean, this isn't to say that he locked him down or anything like that. He just kind of managed him and then he got hurt. And then T.Y. just did T.Y. shit. I don't know. It's. Well, when was the last time T.Y. Hilton had yeah. under 100 yards against I don't think us? he's ever. Yeah. He did Sunday. So. So. Um, but uh, Zach was extremely good again. Like, when you watch the film and you watch Zach, it's so fun. He's so good. I mean, he really is so freaking good. I guess I got to stop saying you guys. <laughs> um, we'll get into that later. Um, you know, let's, let's so yeah, let's just kind of really wrap this up because we got to get we got to get to Bill O'Brien being GM Bill, and honestly, we're at forty minutes, and you know that's the most important part, and it's really hard to do this while the game's on, especially when they're not they're not doing well. Okay, well, let me speed through the defense. Okay. Some of the things I saw today. Um, Zach and BMAC were extremely good. Uh, BMAC is, it, we said it last week and uh, underrated. He's not getting a lot of love. Uh, from like the run defense perspective, Zach and BMAC are just killers. BMAC is everywhere. And specifically on this toss play on third and two, I believe, it typically in years past, you would see a running back be able to get past their linebackers and get a first down. This, this week, that, that's not what happened. BMAC's been incredible all year. Um, last part about the defense of the highlights, I guess, is, um, I, John, I really believe Charles and he was turning into a player. Yeah. He, he looks like he might be something. I mean, really didn't look again. I haven't done a rewatch on the game, but first watch through, he didn't look all that great against them. It looked like it was pretty much JJ and reader doing everything. But prior to this, I'm had looked great. So we'll see. On tape, he okay. looked really good this week. Um, all right. Low lights of the offense. Red zone offense was just awful, which is not something that we've grown to expect this so far this year. It's what we've grown to expect for the last two years. Um, last year specifically, this year we've grown accustomed to scoring touchdowns. That just wasn't the case this week. Um, and then I already touched specifically on the Fells and Aikens play. Um the, the, the no run game was a big, big deal. Two picks, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say one pick. Um, and then on special teams, DeAndre Carter didn't help the field position battle at all. Um, yeah, exactly what we talked about him the other week. Yep. He's just taken literally only the yards that are there. And I mean, he did some things this, this past week that were kind of questionable. So uh, we'll kind of see if he's on the team too much longer. Yeah, I think he's going to get replaced. Um, I don't know if they'll end up being J.J. Nelson or Stephen Smith. Um, maybe they bring in Tyron They brought Johnson Mitchell up. Or Mitchell, that's it, yeah. Um, yep. They brought Mitchell up, so we'll see. Uh, all right, and then on defense, honestly, like this this is really, this is the entire low light, is just the fact that a lack of corners was our biggest issue. Uh, once we lost gains, we already had Roby out. Um, J. Joe's not 100%. All you had was rookie Lonnie Johnson to try to do what he could do. Um, it just, there's really, you know, there's nothing you could do. We lost crossing as well. Um, so this week should be different. We'll get to that later. Uh, to Sean Gibson being out in the second half was an issue with uh, covering Ebron. I do believe that if he would have been covering Ebron on that touchdown, I don't think that would have happened. Um, and then the last thing on defense is I'll say that they, they just, they, JJ has to finish the sacks. Yeah. yeah. He has to get, he has to do that. 
because there are too many times where they're being able to get away from him and make a play. And I know that like JJ is having a great year, but honestly, if this was J- Jadavian Clowney, we wouldn't be saying he's having a great year. And we would be looking at the stat box, or you guys would be. Not listeners, but I guess the average Texans fan. So um, they've got to learn to finish that up. So I guess in summary, yeah, I mean, we knew we kind of knew this was coming. Like with the secondary and the issues, losing Roby for a month, J. Joe being banged up, then we ended up losing Philip Gaines. Um, the biggest thing that happened on Sunday was something that we all expected to happen at some point was we lost Will Fuller for about a month probably longer. Um, I mean, I, there's really not much to say. Like it happens every time around this year, every year around this time. Like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, you could almost set your clock to it. It's unfortunate, but yeah, he's a fantastic player. And I, and I agree with you. There's the only player when he's healthy, that can impact a game the same way he does is Tyreek Hill. Just the, uh, the speed, the route running ability. And Will Fuller is a huge weapon that we will definitely miss. Thankfully, we got Kenny Stills and he kind of drops into Fuller's spot. And he's just as capable as a downfield threat as as Fuller. Um, He's a very polished receiver. He's just not as explosive as Fuller. Yeah. And I mean, that's actually saying a lot because Kenny Stills is a very explosive receiver. Will Fuller's just on another level and he's going to be missed. Yep. And I would argue though, that remember Roderick Johnson, how we were all screaming for him to start at the beginning of the year. Mm. That's how, that's how offensive line thirsty we were. <laughs> no, because John, it's it, not that he, it wasn't that I? bad. It wasn't that bad. He wasn't that bad, but Titus is better. Yes. Titus is better. Uh, the one sack that he gave up, uh, Darren fell stepped onto his ankle and he fell to the ground. Um, so that's, it wasn't like in, in game speed, you would look and see, Oh God, he got pushed back and fell. That's actually not what happened. Um, yeah, we're missing Titus. I mean, we're going to miss Titus for the next, probably another, I would say probably another four, five, maybe six games. If we see him at all the rest of the season. And I wouldn't be surprised if we don't, to be honest with you. I mean, he is yeah, the future right tackle good, of the team. They're going to have to make some tough roster decisions here soon just because, you know, roster space. We can't have all these injuries and keep them all. Yeah. No, it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see. Luckily, we only have two more games and then the bye. So we got Raiders, Jags, then a bye. It, it's coming at the perfect time for us. Luckily, again, it's kind of middle of the season, kind of like last year. So um, it, it's a good time for the bye to happen. Uh, there's still another seven days from today before the trade deadline. So maybe William O'Brien general manager will get back in that GM chair and make another deal like he did yesterday. Transition flawless. Go ahead, John. Here's your William O'Brien segment. Are you going to talk? You've been dying to get to it. Oh, sorry. Um, (laughs) <laughs> you know, I'm I'm kind of confused by this whole we've traded away our entire draft. Yep. We are doing a poor man's imitation of of the Patriots, yet we're getting kind of roasted. We've talked about at length in the past, the biggest thing that the Patriots do is they've identified uh, market inefficiency on established NFL players that are underperforming in other, on other teams. And then what they do at the draft is they trade back and they draft redundantly because they know that you're going to miss in the draft. So we have seven to eight draft picks and a six round draft, but we have no draft picks. And we've gone out and we've grabbed players that are very, very capable However, if you read draft Twitter and I, and I mean, there's a lot of smart guys out there, but I'm not, I'm not trying to trash them, but I'm saying that they put their respecting players as the end all be all. 
And that's not true. The reason why building through the draft is so effective is because you're able to do it cheaply. And when you have a, a, a hard cap, like the NFL currently does, you want to be able to get as many quality players as you can in under that cap. And there's just not a lot of cap space for overplaying veterans because if you overpay veterans, then you're just going to eventually have to pay people at the bottom of the barrel, right? Isn't, is that, are you following what I'm trying to say there? Um, kind of with what the Patriots have done is first off, Tom Brady is just ridiculously underpaid. Um, he's able to do that because his wife's a super supermodel and probably a billionaire and he makes a ton of money on endorsements. So, or the Patriot, that's been the biggest cheat code. Brady's a very, very, I mean, Brady's probably the best quarterback of all time. He's still a very good quarterback and you get him relatively cheap, which gives you enough cap space left over to go out there and get established veterans. This is why when they talk about when you have the rookie contract window on a quarterback, that's your time to go out and succeed. Well, that's where we're at. We have the rookie contract with Deshaun. And this is when we're supposed to load up as many veteran players as we can. High price players, because this is the only time we're probably going to be able to afford it over the next 10 years. We have about four or five years where we can do it. We're already in year three. So we've got maybe one, two more years where we can, kind of depending on when they decide to extend him. So right now we're getting trashed because we're we're getting rid of all of our, our, our draft picks, our early round draft picks, so we can't have cheap players when Deshaun gets re-upped. So how are we supposed to have it both ways when we were dug this hole by the GM that's been fired? That's fair. No, that's fair. I think here's what I think. Uh, and I tweeted it out earlier. So if you guys want to go see it, um, God, the Astros are just giving up hits left and right. Um, when, so I tweeted it out. I, I basically named all the trades and then the amount of picks that we have and then list all the players that we've traded for are th- on contract through 2021. Do you think that that was by accident? Or do you think that that was on purpose? Oh, well, go go off your point. I know it's um... it's on purpose because you gave up two first round picks through 2021. So every single player that you've traded for so far will be on this roster unless they're just completely outperformed. And the only player that has a chance for that to be the case right now is, um. Oh God, a uh, Garrett Conley. And that's only because we just don't know yet. Um, we'll get to him in a second, but, uh, and why I think that he's exactly what we need and why it'll be an under the radar move. But what I'm saying is, is you gave up two first, but yet every single person that you traded for is still going to be under contract, at least through 2021. Duke Johnson's going to be on the team potentially until 2022. He's on a very, very friendly contract. There's no reason to get rid of him. So your and your, your entire offensive line is signed beyond 2021. Uh, outside of Tunsil, um, he will be due a contract in 2021. So I guess what I'm saying is, is, and you still have eight picks next year. Now, no, you don't have a first, but you have eight picks next year. So, you know, I've seen people say Mike Garofalo tweeted out that we're going to need or no GM wants this job, basically. Well, I tweeted at Mike Garofalo, um, th- and he said he got that from GM sources or his GMs that are sources of his. And I tweeted at him, there's a reason why your GMs are available for comment. It's because they're not worthy of being a GM at this time. So it's not that they don't want the job. It's that they can't get the job. There's plenty of GMs that would love to have this job. And it all revolves around literally one person, Deshaun Watson. It revolves around nothing else. Nothing. You have a franchise quarterback and potentially a top five quarterback for the next 10 to 15 years. GMs, that's what they look for. Stability at the most important position 
in all of sports, the quarterback position. So we have picks and everything, every deal that we've made. I think you can make an argument that we overpaid for Laramie Tunsil. But I think you can also make an argument that it was such a need that you didn't overpay and that you got exactly what you needed. And it's a known commodity instead of potentially two other left tackles that maybe wouldn't have worked out. So and and look at Andre Dillard right now. He's not having a great year at this point. And so that just kind of says exactly what John's saying and what we've been saying for quite some time. How many people, and I'll be the first to say it, wanted Andre Dillard over Titus Howard? I did. John, you did. 85% of the Texans fan base did. But look who's turned out to be a better player through seven weeks. Titus Howard. So that just shows you exactly how much of a crapshoot the draft actually is. And everything is okay. Okay? Like, we have eight picks next year. We're going to be fine. If this Conley kid works out, we have him through contract through 2022 because of the fifth-year option because he was a first-round pick. You have Lonnie Johnson. If we re-sign Bradley Roby, you have three corners that have the potential of playing at a high level on your roster. So that need, that position group of need, is no longer a need. The offensive line, no longer a need. Wide receivers, you don't need them. You have plenty. Middle linebackers, you don't need them. You literally have three that could start on any team outside of Seattle and Carolina. So safeties, Justin Reed, Tashawn Gibson. Sure, you can go younger with Tashawn, but he signed for the next three years too, and he's still only 29. Justin Reed, 23. You have another two years of him on his rookie deal. So the only only position that I would say that really we could use is uh, another pass rusher. Um, but outside of that, like when you look at the team and you look at what we have, and then you look at that we still have eight picks, and then right as of right now, eighty-eight million dollars in cap space. That's not taking into account the increase in the cap next year. We'll likely get another ten million. That'll put us at ninety-eight. This is the most ideal situation for any general manager, and we yeah. are in an extremely good spot. Especially any general manager that kind of buys into the Patriots. Um, I guess the Patriots way of doing things, because that's what Bill O'Brien's doing, just as a hyper aggressive and. Again, he's not Bill Belichick. So if you go about it with the same formula that Belichick does, I mean, that's always the magic sauce. I mean, Belichick just seems to get things right. So we'll see. But we're really not in a bad spot at all. We have a franchise quarterback. We have a ton of cap space. And because time's a flat circle, we're back to what we were complaining about two years ago. (laughs) We're going to need a safeties and receivers. As all of a sudden, those are now our two thinnest groups again. And unless Conley just doesn't work out. But again, he Conley, I want to talk about him a little bit because I'm excited about him. He's the same thing as Roby. Um, he's the exact yeah. same player. It's a um, he's more a cover corner that they asked to play zone that can't play zone yet. And have it, if you've ever gone out and tried to play zone in basketball or football, even if you've been coached up on it by a good coach and then you go to another coach that asks you to play zone just slightly different, like zone can be tricky. I mean, especially for young players, um, especially for players trying to be aggressive and first round picks that are trying to go out there and prove that they're worth, prove their worth, prove that they belong in the NFL. Um, these are guys that would get by on physicality. Um, they could play kind of flat footed in a zone because they're always so fast and so big and so long that they could make up that space. When you get in the NFL, you've got to be more precise and it's harder and it's easier to come in and play man when you're a better athlete. And Conley, he's been excellent at, at man coverage. He's just been very, very, very bad at zone. So maybe we can fix him at zone. If not, we're playing the fourth most man in the league right now. We'll just keep playing man. Okay, so Gary and Conley, 6'3", 
four four speed, forty four inch arms. I was extremely high on him coming out of Ohio State. Um, went to play Madden. <laughs> no joke, no joke. Uh, they have a promo called um, it was rookie something, and then they have a draft promo too. But it was the all rookie team. And I pulled a Gary and Conley card and he had 97 speed and I was enticed. And so I used him and he was great for me. So I was like, interesting. So I'm going to watch his rookie tape on the Raiders. He was actually very solid as a rookie when he played man. Then last year, about week seven, I think week six, week seven, he started to turn it on. He was playing more man. Finished the year very strong. This year he comes in and all they're doing is playing zone. And he can't. He's just not a zone corner. When he played the Colts, he played man. Uh, I think he gave up. He was targeted six times and only allowed six yards. He has the potential to be exactly what this what, what we're looking at. He, he's ex- He is, you're dead on, John. He is Bradley Roby. Just a little bit more physical and has better closing speed. Roby doesn't have the best closing speed, but he has the ability to make up speed if beat off of press when playing man. Um, Gary and Conley is, is what we've wanted for quite some time. And honestly, I think he's going to thrive. I really do. I, I, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if he's better than Roby. Man, I hope so. I mean, for those of you that care so much about the draft picks, we now have two first round picks and a second round pick playing cornerback. So, yeah, he's got all the tools. It's just getting him in the right situation and using him correctly. And he should he should be good if he's good. Or I mean, if he's good, that just kind of flips a lot of things on on its head, especially when our team, if we are able to get healthy again this year. Yeah. Well, and Roby will be back. Um, It's just a hamstring. So he'll likely be back after the bye. by that time. Conley should be acclimated to the defense should be clicking. I will Um, never say just a hamstring after Kiki last year. Well, true, 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 true. Um, And then also Kenny this year and now Will Fuller, but whatever. Um, so he'll be back after the bye. Conley will be clicking. Lonnie's going to be better by that time. You'll have three good young corners that can play man and can press and are extremely fast. Um, I like it. I really do. I think it's exactly where we need to be. And they're not even done. They are also kicking the tires on EJ Gaines, who Texans fans have wanted for the last two years. The problem with EJ is he just can't stay healthy. It's with EJ. It's not. It's not a playing. It's not uh, his playing ability. It's just the fact that he can't stay healthy. He's Will Fuller, basically, almost identical from an injury standpoint. Yeah, fair enough. We've talked about him every off season. It feels like he's always a free agent because yep. he only signs one year deals, and he's one of those guys that he's good enough to make more than the vet men, but you kind of know exactly what he is. Like there's no hidden potential with him. He's going to come in. He's going to be average to above average. Um, There's no way he's ever going to turn into a superstar or anything like that. So he's routinely passed over for younger, cheaper players that have higher ceilings, which means this time of year is when he usually is a great time to sign him. Well, and uh, I was uh, reading about him, and this is the first time that he said that he's felt 100% healthy, that every time he's come back uh, a little sooner than than he would have preferred. So, Well, there um, you go. We'll see. Uh, all right. Quick uh, AFC South update. Um, Colts are 4-2. and two, Texans are 4-3. and three. Jags, I think the Jags lost, or I mean won, correct? I totally forgot. I just assumed they won because I think they were playing the Bengals. Um, I think they won too. 
I'm checking right now so I can make sure I give you guys all the updates. Well, either way, they yeah they won. They, got, they won. They won. Either way, they got weaker. They traded away in Gakwe. In Is that yeah? How you they say traded it? away in Gakwe. Uh, they three and four. Of course, they had already traded away Ramsey. So you know what? Even if they won, they lost. Yep. Uh, Titans won, and it looked like Ryan Tannehill might be the answer for them at quarterback. That's kind of scary. We'll give it another week before we truly judge it. But uh, he looked a lot better than anything that they've seen from Mariota. So let it be what it is. Agreed. And they've got, and I mean, their defense isn't bad. So they're a little bit, they're one of those teams that if they start to click on offense, they're a little bit scary. They've invested a ton into that offense. So there's a lot of potential there. Um, Mariota, his head just wasn't on right anymore. And if Tanny Hill just comes in there and, you know, plays average, they're a team that could suddenly be scary, but they're not on the same level as either the Colts or the Texans, but they could be scary and they could be a pain in the ass. Yep. All right. Uh, next week we play the Raiders. Uh, just so everybody knows the game was moved to three twenty-five. Um, Raiders aren't as bad as people think they are. And nope, just they're, FYI, they're one of those pain in the ass teams. Yeah, they're 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 not great. Um, we should easily beat them. But uh, Derek Carr is playing the best football he's ever played. Josh Jacobs is extremely good defense wise. Nothing really to worry about, in my opinion. I think they're okay. They have an okay pass rush. Average linebackers, average corners. Um, I mean, they do have uh, Trayvon Mullen from Clemson, first round rookie. Um, but this should be one of those games where we we walk away. This should be very similar to Atlanta. I wouldn't go that far, but we should win. I would say that. And there's my prediction, by the way. And last week, me and John were both wrong. Yep. We thought we'd beat the Colts. We were wrong. Okay. We were wrong, guys. We were wrong. Hey, first time through, beginner's luck, we we, we crushed it. And we said that it will probably never happen again. And you know what? It probably won't. <laughs> yep. All right. Um, sorry, guys, again, for the uh, pauses and um, uh, and um, hiccups during the podcast. We're watching the World Series, and I've become a Stros fan. So, um, But I'm about to change it to a Laker game. So... Uh, um, with that being said, John, anything else? I'll let you get to the game. Remember, you guys will have another podcast this week. This will be out tomorrow, Wednesday. Uh, Preston will get it out tonight, and then I'll send him over the Zach Hicks conversation. John, anything else? All right. Well, enjoy the rest of your night, hopefully. Uh, with that being said, I am Young Ari Gold signing off for Texans Unfiltered. We will catch you guys next week. Loved this episode of Texans Unfiltered? We'd love for you to be a Patreon supporter. Your support allows us to provide you with the best Texans podcast possible. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at HoustonFBPod and everywhere podcasts can be found. And join our community on www.texansunfiltered.com or on Discord at Texans Unfiltered. Thank you for listening. Until next time.